learners welcome to today's class today we are going to study Kamala Markandeya's novel Nectar in a Sieve it was written in 1954 she is one of the greatest women novelists who won international fame and recognition with the publication of her first novel Nectar in a Sieve with the introduction of English in India there was a spurt of translations and a number of English classics were soon translated into various Indian languages and Indian writers were inspired by these translations. This novel's relationship to a specific time in India's political history is unclear. There is certainly more than one time period in which the work can possibly be situated. The message conveyed here is that Markandeya tries to elevate the book beyond political details. The novel was published less than a decade after India won its independence from Britain in 1947. Nectar in a Sieve is clearly influenced by this event portraying some of the problems encountered by the Indian people as they dealt with the changing times. Markandeya never mentions a specific time or place, however, which gives the story universality. Far beyond its political context, the novel is appealing to modern readers for its sensitive and moving portrayal of the strength of a woman struggling with forces beyond her control. It is a story about the resilience of the human spirit and the importance of values. Now we go into the biographic details of Kamala Markandeya. She was born in 1924 in Mysore in South India. She is a well-known Indo-Anglian women novelist whose contribution has enriched Indian fiction in English. Markandeya is the pen name of the novelist. Her original name was Kamala Purnaya. Kamala Markandeya started her career as a journalist and later took up many jobs. Finally, she became a literary artist. She has been described as anti-colonialist and anti-imperialist. She was awarded the National Association of Independent Schools Award in 1967 and Asian Prize in 1974. She is a prolific writer and has eight novels to her credit. Her works explore the greater themes of life in contrast to art and finding beauty in the mundane. Joseph Hittrick, a critic, has called Kamala Markandaya and I quote, as one of the crispest and most warmly personal of Indian writers. Kamala Markandaya travelled widely outside India, married an Englishman and then settled in England. Poverty, hunger, illiteracy, superstitions, customs and traditions, occupations and professions, the nobility and simplicity which characterise village life in India have all been dealt with in her first novel with rare penetration and realism. Indeed, the novelist has subtitled it as a novel of rural life and this subtitle is fully justified. It is a tragic story dealing with the themes of suffering, starvation and death in a rural community but the story ends on a positive note of quiet strength and resolution. Markandeya's treatment of Indian rural life is comprehensive and all-embracing. It is not idyllic, poetic or one-sided, but poignant and realistic. Through her treatment, she has focused attention on the wretched plight of the poor and destitute and has shown, particularly to her Western readers, a way of life remarkable for its heroic endurance and innate goodness. In short, the novel is a realistic presentation of the suffering, hunger and starvation which is the fate of the Indian peasant even today. But it cannot be called a cry of despair. Rather, it is a great tragic novel, an apotheosis of the human spirit like all great tragedies. The experiences it narrates and the life it depicts have a universal appeal and are as relevant today as they were when the novel was written almost six decades ago. The title comes from the poem Work Without Hope by Samuel Taylor Coleridge and I quote the lines Work without hope draws nectar in a sieve and hope without an object cannot live. 
The novel shows that hope or the sweetness in life that is nectar can be difficult to hold on to. Almost like trying to carry it in a vessel full of holes, symbolically a sieve. The title is suggestive and captures attention. It creates interest. It refers to the fact that it is as impossible for the Indian farmer to enjoy the nectar of happiness for any length of time. The experiences of life are like a sieve which has many holes through which the nectar flows out in no time. Nectar means the drink of gods or Amrit and such a drink is the source of great joy, peace and contentment. Sieve means a small circular utensil of steel with holes in the bottom to separate grain from the chaff. Nectar in the novel is the idyllic poetic aspect of life in the countryside. The nature is beautiful and sweet birds sing and the air is refreshing. The rural dwellers are satisfied and contented in spite of the lack of material comforts of a sophisticated society. Though they are poor, they have nectar of spiritual peace and tranquility. The subtitle which the novelist has given to the novel throws further light on the theme of the novel. Markenteya has subtitled it a novel of rural India. For the novel deals with the life of poverty, hunger and suffering lived by poor tenant farmers in the countless Indian villages. In this way, she has revealed the soul of India not only really to the West but also to the educated elite of India living comfortable lives in the cities. In short, both the main and subtitles of the novel are equally apt and hint at the themes, plot and treatment of the novel. Dear learners, now we go into the detailed study of the novel. The plot of the novel is easily divisible into two parts. The first deals with the life of Rukmani and Nathan in the village and the second with their life in the city. Nectar in a sieve is a first person narrative narrated by the protagonist Rukmani, the widow of a poor tenant farmer in India during the early 1950s. She begins her story with her marriage to Nathan. The marriage is arranged and because Rukmini is the fourth daughter and there is very little dowry, her best match is to a poor rice farmer. She begins her life with him and finds him to be very kind and loving. He is so understanding that he is not threatened by her ability to read and write. Soon she gives birth to their first child, a daughter whom they name Airavati or Aira. She is worried, however, when many years pass and no more children come. Just prior to her mother's death, Rukmini meets the man caring for her mother, a doctor named Kennington or Kenny. She talks to him about her inability to conceive and he helps her. Rukmini never tells to Nathan that the reason she gives birth to four sons in four years is because of Kenny's help. The family is very happy despite having little food or money. During one of her visits to Dr. Kenny, Rukmini is seen by Kunti who at once charges her with having an affair with Kenny and later on she uses this fact to blackmail and exploit Rukmini. Years later, a tannery is built in the small village where Rukmini and her family live. While many villagers welcome it, Rukmini is resistant because of the changes it brings to the community. When her two older sons go to work in the tannery, she is forced to accept it. Ira is now 14 and old enough to get married. Rukmini has a matchmaker find a good husband even though there is a small dowry. A favorable match is made and Ira moves to the home of her husband. However, misfortunes overtake them swiftly one after another and they are totally ruined. The heavy and devastating rains are followed in the next year by a severe drought. Their full and rich crop is totally scorched and destroyed. It means complete ruin for them. They have no money and nothing to eat. Rukmini had saved a little rice and had kept it concealed even from other members of the family. 
as they couldn't pay the landlord he sells the land for a handsome price unable to find a livelihood in the village they are forced to go to the city to seek shelter with rukmani's son murugan the scene now shifts from the village to the city they experience great difficulty in finding whereabouts of their son murugan it is a very big city and in the night they seek shelter in a temple and eat the food given by way of charity to numerous beggars their bundle is stolen and they find themselves entirely destitute beggars for all practical purposes nathan suffers from rheumatism and has frequent attacks of fever he becomes weak and is often forced to lie down in the midst of work at last they reach their son murugan with the help of a 9 year old boy puli they reach the house and are heartbroken to find that murugan has deserted his wife and children destitute and forlorn they go away from their daughter in law and to seek shelter in the temple again but this cannot go on forever they must work so that they may earn and save something and thus return to their village again with the help of puli they are able to find work in a quarry as stone breakers and try to earn the return fare to the village but cruel fate plays strange tricks on them one day there are heavy rains nathan is drenched has high fever and dies in the night Rukmini is all alone in the wide world and her grief is indescribable. Puli is with her and she pours her grief and lamentations into his ears. Finally, she returns to the village with Puli, her adopted son who is unwell. Selvam and Ira welcome them with open arms. Selvam assures them that he will feed them and take care of them. Puli is duly treated and his sores are soon cured. Time is a great healer and with the passing of time Rukmini regains her spiritual calm and tranquility. It is and I quote with calm of mind all passion spent that she surveys her past and narrates her life story. Dear learners now we can have a look at the themes of the novel there are many themes dealt with in the novel and the first would be the theme of the home home as you all know is a place of stability it represents safety and protection when rukmini leaves home to go to the city she leaves it only physically a home lives on in her memory and it travels with her as she struggles in her new life Nathan and Rukmini constantly dream of returning home. Their home is not a place that exists any longer, but it is a space in their memories and emotions that symbolizes their sense of belonging. Another theme would be the theme of transformation. Transformation has many facets in Nectar in a Sieve. Characters are transformed by hardship, learning how to endure and transcend difficulties. The town is transformed by the tannery which disrupts caste traditions and the environment. The world is becoming modern and industrial, a change from rural and agricultural. Characters have no choice but to transform if they are to survive and this transformation occurs not only socially but also personally. A next theme and an important one would be the theme of life. consciousness and existence the meaning of life is constantly questioned in this novel life means different things to different characters for example for rukmini it is an opportunity for endurance and spiritual cleansing through suffering for nathan life is about finding little joys and simple pleasures Kenny's life is about helping those who suffer regardless of the cost to one's self. Life's meaning is a dynamic thing and it changes with circumstances. Life must have some innate value that makes it worth living. 
the characters struggle and find that meaning each in their own way. The next would be the theme of hunger and starvation. The novelist paints a very tragic picture of hunger realistically depicted through the heroic struggle of Nathan and Rukmini, the central figures. They face starvation and hunger and I quote, in its most gruesome and degrading form, end quote. Old granny gives her last rupee to Ira's son and then dies of starvation. Hunger not only kills, it also degrades and dehumanizes. Now we can come to the next theme which is the theme of East-West Encounter. This theme is studied through Dr. Kenny and his love-hate attitude towards the Indian rustics among whom he carries on his work. Western technology and science is represented by the tannery. It also presents the contrast between tradition and modernity, industrial, agricultural tensions, themes of exodus and rootlessness are also brought in. Nectar in a Sieve is the sad story of a large poverty stricken Hindu family in a remote rural village in southern India. Rukmini or Ruku married Nathan and bore a daughter Ira and six sons. With very little substance to begin with, the family became dependent on a small tract of land they rented from a heartless absentee landlord. Kenny, the white doctor whose ambition was to build a hospital with the foreign aid he collected, became a close family friend and helped them with money, food and medicine. Despite valiant efforts, the family failed to extricate itself from abject poverty caused by hardships of nature and economics. In spite of their hardships, the family exhibited love, contentment and hope that their situation would improve, but this hope never became a reality. Learners, now we'll have a critical analysis of the novel and in that we'll be looking at the place, the time, the narrative voice and the figurative language. First, we'll look at the place in the novel. Part 1 of the novel takes place in an unnamed village in rural India while part 2 takes place in an unnamed major city in urban India. Markantaya's decision to avoid specifics is deliberate. The first part of the story could take place in any part of any agricultural nation and the second part in among any sector of the urban poor. This lack of specificity opens the scope of nectar in a sieve. This story could apply to families other than Rukmanis. The characters go for subsistence living in a largely agricultural economy to barely making a living in a city economy. Times are changing and industrialization is encroaching on the rural areas. So the agricultural and working classes are forced to move into similar situations of poverty in urban landscapes. Now we look at the time. Markandaya avoids a specific time frame in the novel which makes the notion of time ambiguous. There is however a lot to interpret in the ambiguity. One argument is that the book anticipates India's colonial independence. So, it could be before 1947. On the other hand, some say that Markandeya's fictitious world may be a reflection on the country after India's independence. Now we can look at the narrative voice. As you all know, Rukmini is the narrator of her own story, which she tells in a flashback. What Ruku chooses to tell us illustrate her own values and personality. The events of the story take on an added meaning when we realize that they are excerpts of an entire life. What Rukmini shares with us are those special moments that a dying woman reflecting on her life thinks are important. This flashback first person point of view allows the whole story 
to be Ruku's own reflections on her own life. She tells us the story as past tense and she occasionally adds comments and interpretations that she couldn't have known at that time. Now we have a look at the figurative language used in the novel. Throughout Nectar in a Sieve, Mark and Daya uses literary devices. For example, insightful similes, well-designed allegories and vibrant imagery. These aspects enable western readers to understand and enjoy this novel whose setting, people and culture are completely unfamiliar. These devices also help the reader to connect with the events of the book through the universality of the experience and images. Mark and Dea frequently uses similes and metaphors drawn from the village life with which she has been familiar right from her childhood. Why is this long well important? It is important because it is one of the pioneering novels in Indian English literature. Another factor which makes the novel important in the history of Indian English literature is the depiction of the rural life. Kamala Markandeya takes special care to give a realistic and deep penetrated look into the rural life. You can say that it is one of the first depictions of rural India. Another fact is that this novel was well received not only in India but also in the West. This factor is poignant to Indian English writing because this put Indian rural scene on the world map. So in the novel, she doesn't depict the rural life as a negative aspect of life but she also tries to bring in many positive elements. For example, the endurance, the strength and the importance of value which form a formative influence on the life of the rural people. In a way, the novel also tries to deal with the transformation that has come in the life of every Indian. It is also important to know that she has even depicted a western character, for example, Dr. Kenny in the novel. In this way, she is contrasting the life of the Indian with the other or the outsider. The contrast between the city life and the rural life is well depicted and well described by the novelist in the novel. The most important aspect of the novel is of course the universality of the novel. There is no specific time in which the events takes place, there is no specific name given to the village or to the city. These aspects shows that this novel has relevance even today. Because even if we look at the villagers life today, it is the same plight. It is the same plight of starvation, poverty and endurance. So we can conclude that even if the novel is written six decades ago, it has much relevance and much importance to the Indian's life even today. Dear learners, we have come to the end of this part. Now we will have a summary of whatever we discussed in this part. There are certain things to be kept in mind as we go into a deep study of the novel. First of all, the time of publication, the year 1954. It was a time when novel as a genre was emerging. A novel in English at that time is very important to the literary history of Indian English literature. So we can say that Kamala Markandeya is a pioneer in this area. Known for writing about culture clash between Indian urban and rural societies, Markandeya's first published novel, Nectar in a Sieve, was a bestseller. Kamala Markandeya belonged to that pioneering group of Indian women writers who made their mark not just through their subject matter but also through their fluid, polished literary style. Nectar in a Sieve was her first published work and its depiction of rural India and the suffering of farmers made it popular in the West. The clash between East and West and the tragedy that resulted from it 
or the problems facing ordinary middle class Indians making a living, finding inner peace, coping with modern technology and its effect on the poor are all depicted by her very realistically in the novel. Nectar in a Sieve, translated into more than a dozen languages, is a poignant story of peasant India. The storms of nature and the winds of change stoically borne by landless peasants. Though the book meticulously avoids specifics about the time and place of the story, some context clues gives us a sense that the work is an exploration of socio-economic and political issues in the novelist contemporary India. We see these often controversial issues addressed by the protagonist Rukmini, who is also called Ruku. India's political situation is not explicitly discussed, but there is enough to glean that Markandeya is writing about the changing political and economic situation in her country. She published Nectar in a Sieve in 1954, seven years after India gained colonial independence from Britain. This was a time that was very crucial and poignant to the history of India. So this gives her novel an extra importance. Many traditions in India were eroded by British rule and the developments brought upon by the Industrial Revolution lured many young Indians away from their traditional roles to participate in a new economy. Such is the case with the arrival of the tannery in Rukmini's village and the decision of her sons to leave the land for work of a different nature. Rukku's literacy also points to the reforms in educational system that allowed many Indians to explore the importance of justice and freedom. Rukku's son rely less on traditional religious notions of the good of suffering and more on ideas about the importance of political freedom and economic security. This novel is thus one of the first novels to talk about the changing times. It was as if Kamala Markandeya opened up a window to the world. The universal setting of the novel is another important aspect that stands out. The characters, the places and the time are really flexible. No matter the place or the time, it is a novel that portrays the plight of the human. This book is a great reminder that no matter where we may be, the quest for survival is a driving force in all of us. And these characters' struggles have parallels in our lives. No matter what hardship we may face, from famine to flood to factory closings, as a species, we struggle on. And that struggle is something fundamental that defines us all in every part of the world. Another aspect that stands out is the title, the subtitle and the epigraph. The title is taken from the poem Work Without Hope written by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. The lines are, and I quote the lines, Work without hope draws nectar in a sieve and hope without an object cannot live. These lines very clearly captures the essence of the novel. The plight of the poor man is to always go on struggling for a better life which they never attain. Even when they go on with the pain and suffering, it is as if they have nothing left to hold on to just like the nectar in a sieve. In the novel, this aspect is very clearly and realistically captured. The subtitle, A Novel of Rural Life, is also very appropriate to the novel as Markandeya has very realistically portrayed the Indian village touching upon all the aspects.